Welcome to our Sunday service. I'm Diane Dancer and I've been a member of San Gabriel Unitarian Universalist Fellowship for six years. I'm so glad you joined us for this service as we focus on gaining a basic knowledge of Islam and what it is like to be an American Muslim. Our speaker is Mohammed Al-Badawi from the Islam Center of Round Rock. San Gabriel Unitarian Universalist is a social justice oriented fellowship where all are welcome. If you are a visitor and want to gain a better understanding of who we are, look for information at the end of the service about our activities and how to stay connected. You can also follow us on Facebook. Lighting the chalice is one of our UU rituals. If you have a chalice or candle at your home, I hope you will join me and light yours as well this morning. The light of the sun does not lift the shadows that have fallen on humanity the world over. We relight our chalice flame to reignite a spirit of radical optimism, knowing that it takes all, all of us living what matters to dispel those who would divide us. All manner of things will be well, if we make them well. May our free religious communities embody the right relationships our world so desperately needs. I am Mohammed Al Badawi, and I volunteer with the different Islamic centers in Central Texas. Today, I'm joining you on behalf of the Round Rock Islamic Center. Praise be to God. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for allowing me to share some of the basics about the Islamic faith or the religion of Islam with you. 
you will see, God willing, that there are many things in common between us, and there are also some uh, differences. I'm glad to have this opportunity to be with you. Like most religious places, unfortunately, the Islamic centers in central Texas have limited access due to COVID-19. However, if you would like to visit any Islamic center, please feel free to reach us at austinmuslims.org, and I'll be more than happy to find out an accommodation for your visit with us. I pray to God the Almighty that he bless all our actions, and I pray that he may guide us all to his path so that everything that we could do or we can do is always in a way that is pleasing to him. Thank you. The Affirmation. The doctrine of this church is love. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity and fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow in harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other. Good morning, Saint Gabriel. So happy to be with you today. I've got a wonder box with me. What could be in here? Let's use our wondering minds to help each other learn and grow. And make some guesses. Let's see. Is it making... It's noise, Something, something's clunking in there, but not a lot of noise. It's not very heavy, I can tell you that. So make a guess, tell someone who's near you what you think might be in here and we'll open it up. Are you ready? Hmm. We've got a metal, well, a pretend metal, maybe a costume metal. Metal in here and scarf. This is one of my scarves. Many colors. Hmm, what could a scarf and a metal have to do with each other? Well, the story I'm about to share with you was written by an Olympic athlete. And Iftihaj Muhammad represented the U.S. on our sword fencing team. And she was the first Olympic athlete to compete and then win a medal while wearing her scarf, her hijab. We are learning about Islam today and many Muslim women choose to wear a hijab or other head covering as a sign of their faith. Are you ready for the story? It's called The Proudest Blue by Ibtihaj Muhammad with S.K. Ali, illustrated by Hatem Ali, shared with permission by Little Brown Books for Young Readers. Mama holds out the pink. Mama loves pink, but Asya shakes her head. I know why. Behind the counter is the brightest blue the color of the ocean, if you squint your eyes and pretend there's no line between the water and the sky. It's the first day hijab. Asiya knows it, I know it, we're sisters. The next day I wait, a new backpack, new light up shoes. I feel special, I feel like twirling. Asiya comes out of the house and I stop. It's the most beautiful first day of school ever. I'm walking with a princess, so I pretend I'm one too. But even princesses have to stop to cross the street. Asya takes my hand in hers, says, come on, Faiza, we speed walk it. 14 steps, 14 light ups to get across. Asya takes me to my line first, hugs me goodbye. I turn to watch her leave, give a little curtsy to the princess going to the sixth grade area. She's easy to see, her job, smiles at me the whole way. My first day at hijab is going to be blue too. What's that on your sister's head? The girl in front of me whispers. A scarf, I whisper back. I don't know why a whisper came out. I try again, louder now. A scarf, hijab. Oh, she whispers. Asya's hijab isn't a whisper. Asya's hijab is like the sky on a sunny day. The sky isn't a whisper. 
It's always there, special and regular. The first day of wearing hijab is important, Mama had said. It means being strong. I turn, but I can't see the blue anymore. I run to the big kid's side, 27 steps to see Asya. I need to give her another hug. I need to see her smile. Faiza? Asya's eyes wonder why I'm here. Are you excited, I ask, about the first day of hijab? She nods, smiling big, and I feel better. Somebody laughs from nearby, a boy pointing at Asya. Why? Asya's hijab isn't a laugh. Asya's hijab is like the ocean waving to the sky. It's always there, strong and friendly. Some people won't understand your hijab, Mama had said, but if you understand who you are, one day they will too. In class, I draw a picture. Two princesses in hijab having a picnic on an island where the ocean meets the sky. The girl who whispered in line says she likes it. She says it out, it's so loud the teacher comes over to see it. I wonder if Asya drew a picture too. Recess time is for five cartwheels in a row. I land the last one near the sixth graders, near Asya and her friends, near a boy yelling, I'm going to pull that tablecloth off your head. Asya's hijab isn't a tablecloth. Asya's hijab is blue, only blue. Asya turns away, her friends turn away. They race to the middle of the schoolyard, their shoes pounding the pavement, playing tag. Mama said, don't carry around the hurtful words that others say. Drop them, they are not yours to keep. They only belong to those who said them. It takes me 48 steps to get away from the yelling boy. After school, I look around. I look for whispers, laughs, and shouts. But I only see Asya waiting for me, like it's a regular day. She's smiling, strong. We cross the road, hand in hand. I can't wait to get home, to show Mama the picture I drew, to show Asya that I'm wearing the same hijab in it. Because Asya's hijab is like the ocean and the sky, no line between them, saying hello with a loud wave, saying I'll always be here like sisters, like me and Asya. Thank you to Muhammad al-Badawi for his recommendation of this book. It was wonderful to see this rite of passage of wearing the hijab through the eyes of a younger sister. As we increase our understandings of the many different cultures and religions in our world, we live out our sixth principle to help create a more just and peaceful world. We'll talk more about that in our RE time today with Mr. Spoon. Bye-bye. Many thanks to the members and friends of the San Gabriel Fellowship for making our Stewardship Pledge Drive a big success. On behalf of the Board and the Stewardship Committee, thank you all so very much. Take a moment now to relax, breathe, and meditate.
So today I would like to discuss with you <clears throat> some of the common words that is used in Islam. So what is Islam? Islam is a word that comes from the Arabic root verb silm. Arabic is a Semitic language. Most Semitic languages have root verbs and from that verb you can conjugate multiple different things. The word silm in Arabic means peace and submission. So that's where the, the word Islam really comes from. So it's not really based on a name of a tribe or a locality or a geographical location. We as Muslims believe that everything in this universe submits to God. The movement of the earth around the sun, all the natural laws that we have, they are all submitting to their creator, the almighty Lord. So to us, Islam is really about achieving peace through submission to God. We achieve peace uh, by following the rules of Allah, the rules of God, by uh, obeying the, the, the way that he asks us to follow. Um, and now, that submission has to happen in what we call in a trust and love relationship, meaning you cannot force someone to be a Muslim. You cannot force someone to submit to God the Almighty. In the second chapter of the Holy Quran, God himself says, right, there is no compulsion of religion. You cannot force one to accept any faith, let alone even Islam because that acceptance must be done through love. Um, it, to us, Islam is a complete way of life, meaning it goes beyond just a set of rituals and a set of uh, you know, uh, prayers and, and, and fasting or something like that. It, it, it encompasses all of our life. It governs the way that we behave and the way we do our, uh, our de dealings as well. Islam is a monotheistic faith. And that is, of course, meaning uh, that, of course, means the oneness of God. And if anything that you take out of this uh, presentation today, please take this point home, because it is a critical point in the Islamic tradition. The oneness of God is, is, is the cornerstone of Islam. And what we mean by the oneness of God, it is an absolute oneness, not just unity. So we know, for example, some other faiths or some other traditions, they have the concept of Trinity, you know, Trinity makes one God. But in Islam, that does not exist. It is an absolute oneness of God. Uh, there is a chapter in the Quran. It's only three verses. Uh, chapter 112. Allah, you know, it says in it, the translations say, he is Allah, the one, the absolute, the eternal. He begets not, nor is he begotten. And there's nothing like him or there's none like him. And you can tell clearly the emphasis on the concept of the oneness of God. So Allah, what is Allah? I already mentioned it a couple of times. Allah is the Arabic word for God. You know, if you open a, 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 a Bible in the Arabic language, for example, a translation of the Arabic in, the, you know, in Arabic, you will see that in the beginning, you know, God created the heavens and the earth. It will say in the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So it's just the, the Arabic word. And I mention this because sometimes people actually, you know, curse Allah. <laughs> uh, they say they think it's the Lord of the Arabs or the Lord of, of the Muslims or whatever it is, right? Uh, but it's really is just an English, is the Arabic word for the English word, God with a capital G. Um, the word again has nothing to do with the Arabs <laughs> or the tribes or the Lord of the Arabs. And the most recent one I hear that the Lord of the moon is for some reason, <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just really a, uh, it's, it's not accurate. It's just an Arabic word for the word God. It is unique though in Arabic because it has no plural. You know, Arabic does have pl plurals. Uh, for example, a table, tables, you could, you know, the equivalent in Arabic, you could conjugate it and make it plural. But the word Allah has no plural. Uh, and it also means, it just only means the true, the one true God. Now, Allah um, describes himself as no vision can grasp him, but his grasp is over, all, is over all vision, which really means we don't, as Muslims, associate any specific image or physical shape of God. You know, in some traditions, they say that, you know, uh, God, a human being is created on the image of God. To us, that does not really mean that um, that you are, you know, the same physical, sh that God is the same physical shape of the human being, but rather it means a couple of things that we can see, then God can see, but how, we do not know, right? It doesn't mean that he has eyes like our eyes, right? We can hear, which means our creator who created our hearing, he himself also can hear, but doesn't mean he has Years. That's one. That's one. That's one interpretation, or that's one, one, one understanding of it. The second understanding of it is that when we say, um, you know, is, is that um, God is merciful. He wants us to be mercy. He wants us to be merciful as well. God is compassionate. He wants us to be compassionate. So we don't associate a picture 
we don't associate an image of God because uh, our our mind is so limited, right? Our so our mind is so limited to the things. Even our imagination is limited to the things that we are aware of, or with the way the, the things that we understand. How can anyone <clears throat> understand, you know, or or imagine the the, the divine himself? Um, in Islam, Allah has what we call beautiful attributes or beautiful names. The word name in Arabic means attribute or a pro you know, proper name. Um, and, uh, you know, God Almighty has, you know, what we know, of, we know of 99 names, but of course, actually, there's more. Uh, but those are like the one we, we, we usually reference to. And those beautiful names of God kind of describe who God is. So while we cannot associate an image with him, we can understand who he is through his attributes. So for example, we have the word Ar-Rahman, which means the most merciful, right? He is Ar-Rahim, the most gracious. He is Al-Baqi, the everlasting. Al-Alim, the most knowledgeable, and so on. So once you start going through those attributes of God, you can realize who the majesty of the Lord is without you actually understanding a physical shape or, or, or image to him. Um, now, as we live our lives as Muslims, we are encouraged to continue to look at those names and continue to understand those names and try to live up to those names. So for example, God is the most merciful. We have to be merciful as well. Uh, but you know, we all realize that we are limited in capacity. So we will never be as merciful as God. But every time you show compassion, you show mercy, you are trying to get closer to God. Uh, well, one example like I, I give to the people is about uh, mercy. You know. We do not truly understand mercy until somebody wrongs us, and then you have to be merciful for that person or, you know, to forgive that person, right? Um, and God is the all-forgiving. So how can you grow in that, how, how can you grow in that attribute of forgiveness? Well, when somebody does something wrong to you, that's when you forgive and forgive and forgive. And then that's how you develop this concept of forgiveness, because you're getting closer to God every time you forgive. But then you realize that you can never be as forgiving as God the Almighty. So our journey in, in, throughout our life is really to continue to grow through the understanding of the attributes of Allah. Now, when I keep saying that God does not have a physical image, also understand that he's not just a philosophical concept or a deity that is far removed from us. Actually, he's very close to us. And we as Muslims think of him as, you know, <laughs> let's use the, the terminology personal God, that he is very close to us, very close to us. He is uh, approachable, he's loving, he's caring, he's merciful, right? And our relationship with God is direct. In Islam, we don't have the concept of hierarchy, right? Um, there is a verse in the chapter two, uh, God says, when my servants ask you about me, I am near. You know, it, it even doesn't even say, tell them I am near. I think this is the wrong translation. It says, I am near, right? Don't even, you know, does not tell the prophet to, you know, broadcast that message. I am near, which means the relationship between an individual and God is direct. And then God says, I reply to the supplications of those who ask me. So all what a person has to do, just direct, directly ask Allah, directly ask God of what they want. Uh, that's why we encourage people to continue to ask God for guidance, right? Ask God for help, ask God for forgiveness, ask God to show you the path, ask God to show you, you know, what you need, what is better for you. And you do not need to go to a pastor, you do not need to go to, to a, you know, to a, uh, to a you know, knowledgeable person, it just, it's just sincere, genuine communication from the individual to God the Almighty. Notice that I also said, I've been using the word he about God, him or he. Uh, and the reason is, uh, first of all, you know, he does not mean male, for sure. Uh, the Arabic language does not have the concept of it. And the Arabic language is one of those languages that associate masculine and feminine to different objects, right? Uh, because that's how, the, that's how the language structures. Sometimes in English, we do that. For example, somebody refers to a boat, he would say, isn't she a beauty, right? Uh, and the Arabic language has the same, con has, you know, has that construct built into it. And God referred to himself as a he, so we refer to him as a he, right? It has nothing to do with a, you know, being a male or a female. Okay, so the second thing I want to talk to you about is Muhammad. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger of God. So the message of Islam came to us throughout, uh, through Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Our view is that God the Almighty has always sent messengers throughout history. The, 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 the first prophet was Adam, the first creation. And after that came Noah and so on. And the final prophet is Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
Muhammad was born in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, 570 CE, that's the common era. So roughly he's about 600 years after Jesus, peace be upon him. Um, he started the message of Islam at the age of 40. So Muhammad was lived for 40 years in Mecca uh, and he was not a prophet, he was a shepherd, he was a merchant, he dealt with different, you know, in, 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 in different trades. And at the age of 40, that's when he started receiving the revelation. And the message continued for 23 years after that. Mm -hmm. So he lived 63 years total. Now, he lived 13 years in Mecca after the message. And then he was forced, you know, to, to, to uh, he was driven out of Mecca to a city called Medina, which is north of Mecca, roughly, I think, around 600 miles or so north of Medina. And that's where he, you know, lived another 10 years and total 63. And he has passed away and um, uh, he's, he died and he's buried in the city of Medina. Um, Muhammad was known well before Islam in the city of Mecca as what, you know, with the title Al-Amin, the trustworthy one. Um, because he, you know, you know, he, people just knew his character that he was trustworthy. In fact, they, you know, they, if somebody wants to travel and he has something valuable, he would deposit it with Muhammad before he leaves. He was also known as for his moral excellence. And when he came, you know, when he became a prophet, he continued to, to drive forward for moral excellence. One of his sayings that, which translates as, I was sent, or the purpose of my mission is to perfect moral excellence. Right? Now, here is another saying, here's a saying of Muhammad where he describes his relationship to the previous prophets. He said, my example to the rest of the previous prophets before me is like an example of a person who built this beautiful building and he left one brick out. And the people would come, of course, to this building and they look at it, wow, how beautiful this building is. But then they ask, well, you know, where is that missing brick? And Muhammad said, I am that last brick. So what he really is saying is that the message of Islam came to build upon the same messages that came before, the same message that came from the previous prophets through uh, Abraham and his children and Moses and Jesus and so on. And Muhammad just being the seal of those prophets. He did not come to destroy what these message, what those messengers came up with, with the concept of the oneness of God. Rather, he is just the last uh, of that caravan of, of, of prophets. So we consider him as Muslims to be the seal of the prophets, meaning there's no other prophets after Muhammad. The, the, the whole purpose of the message of a prophet is to send us the message from God. And you know, by the grace of God, we have fully documented uh, the holy scriptures, the sayings of Allah, which is through the Quran, and we fully have documented the sayings of Muhammad. Then we do not need any more prophets or messengers. We have the same thing uh, between you know as those as those people receive those revelations. Uh, Muhammad is not the founder of Islam, and the reason we say that is because. As I mentioned earlier, Islam is about submission to God, right? So we believe that the message of Moses was also Islam, to submit to God, for people to follow God. We believe the message of Jesus was also Islam. The message of Abraham, uh, you know, is also Islam. For, the, for, you know, to bring humanity, to submit to God and accept God in, in, in peace. So it's Muhammad technically is not, in our view, he's the founder of Islam. Um, there is some term, it's an old term, um, you know, called Muhammadins. It's an offensive to Muslim, really, because it shows ignorance. Muslims do not worship Muhammad. We worship Allah. We worship only one God. Muhammad is a messenger. We, we hold Muhammad in a high status, as a, but he's a human being, right? We do not worship him. Um, as I mentioned, we believe also in the previous prophets. Now, the Quran has narrated to us the names of 23 of those prophets from biblical traditions. You're probably familiar with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Jesus, David, Solomon. So those names or those stories of those prophets are mentioned in the Quran. And the Quran also told us there are many nations have received other prophets. So there are many more prophets that just we do not know about them. God said every nation has received a messenger of God. And as Muslims, we do not distinguish between the prophets. We are commanded actually not to distinguish between the prophets. So we value Muhammad as much as we value Jesus. We value Muhammad as much as we value Abraham and Moses. The only difference is that we as Muslims, we preserve the scriptures, we preserve the writings, you know, the sayings of Muhammad, where the previous uh, uh, prophets, they're, they're, you know, their people did not you know, do a really good job at the preserving of the scriptures. If somebody today can show me a piece of scriptures that Jesus, peace be upon him, said, 
and it's a hundred, you know, I can authenticate that truly Jesus said that, right? We Muslims follow, we have no problem with doing that. Uh, but the thing is that today, the only that the only thing that has been verifiable, or the thing, the only thing that is verifiable that we from our from, from our perspective, verifiable, it is really the teachings of Islam. We have spent a lot, our scholars have spent a you know tremendous amount of, of deal of, of verification and, and documenting the sayings of Muhammad and the word of God. Um, so we believe, you know, we believe that uh, previous prophets also received books, you know, and uh, uh, for example, as the poor, the, the Psalms, the Torah, the gospel or the Injil. But as I said here, where, you know, the, you know previous prophets, you know, they, they, were, they were holy books. B because as I mentioned that we don't believe that the existing books that we have today are the same uh, scriptures that was revealed to them. I'll, I'll give, just give you an example uh, from a Muslim perspective. Jesus, peace be upon him, spoke Aramaic, right? Today, we don't, have, we don't have a single version of the Bible that is in the true tongue of Jesus, peace be upon him. That is, you know, literally was written in Aramaic and then translated from Aramaic to different languages. We found, you know, uh, Bibles in Hebrew, maybe in English, right? Uh, and maybe later translated back to Aramaic, but the, the, the native tongue of Jesus, peace be upon him, is, is not there. The same thing, if you look at the Torah, some, some, some of the Torah, you know, uh, was written almost 600 or 700 years after Moses, peace be upon him. Um, anyway, going back to Muhammad, this is what, you know, we believe that he is the, the last uh, uh, prophet in this caravan of beautiful prophets, and he is the messenger to all humanity, O Muhammad, that's what the Quran says about him, we have sent you a mercy to all mankind. And of course, if he said to all mankind, this means the message has to be uh, authenticated and validated and preserved. Uh, it is important for people in our perspective to study his life and what he has called for. Now, I mentioned the Quran a lot. Uh, Al-Quran is our holy scriptures, just like what the, you know, the Christian, for example, would consider the Bible or the Jews would consider the Torah. Uh, we believe it is the literal word of God. The Quran was revealed to Prophet Muhammad over 23 years period. So, you know, as I said, he was a prophet at the age of 40, right? And he lived for 23 years. So throughout the 23 year period, the Quran was revealed in pieces to him. The, the, beauty, the, the beauty about the Quran is that, um, a, is that Muhammad was illiterate. He could not read or write. And yet in the Quran, you find a lot of, a lot of historical context, a lot of things about the future, some, some even you know, scientific miracles, so, so, you know, scientific statements and so on. And to us as Muslims, we believe that it is the everlasting miracle of a prophet because every generation that comes after Muhammad, when they study the Quran or when they read the Quran, they find in the Quran, something that the previous generation did not find. And they find in the Quran, either scientific miracles or additional beauty or something like that, that other people could not find. And that's why it is truly the everlasting miracle of Muhammad. Uh, it is, uh, the Quran is about 114 chapters, varies in length. I already showed you one chapter that was, for example, only three <laughs> verses long, where you look at second, the second chapter is about almost 250 plus verses long. So it varies in, in, in length. Um, roughly if you, no, no, normal uh, type of uh, writing, it'll be about 600 plus pages. Uh, 6,236 verses combined. Now, the Quran is only in Arabic. <clears throat> now, there is a lot of different translations out there. You know, there's translation in every language of the Quran, but the true Quran is only in Arabic because we do not consider the translation to be a Quran. I mean, at the end of the day, one cannot translate poetry or cannot translate a joke from one language to another one, let alone translate the word of God. So the, you know, so we, you know, we have to preserve the original text and then you know, the translation can get the proximate meaning as much as possible. But if somebody wants to go back to the original text and go back into what each word means and go back to the, to the, you know, to the verb of that word and the meaning that it carries and so on, it is, it is definitely available for, for, for us. Uh, we consider the Quran and the tradition of Prophet Muhammad, we call it the Sunnah, to be the uh, sources of Islamic law or known as the Sharia law. Now, let me switch over to Muslims in America. Uh, Muslims in America, um, today, the number of Muslims in America is really small. We are about 1% of the population in the United States. 1%, very little. And by 2050, if you look at this Pew chart, is expected to double to 2%. <laughs> so uh, the, it's still the, the vast majority of people in the United States is far, you know, far away from Islam. Um, but, but this is really important because um, a lot of misconceptions are being carried about Muslims in America, that they're trying to change our laws or trying to do this and that. 
and and if you really just look at the statistics, right, it's it's just it's just mind boggling to 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 see that you know the accuracy of such statements. Okay, Muslims in America um, came in in the early days um, in the eight hundred you know almost uh, eight hundred you know eight hundred AD. Uh, the Moorish and Malik traders came in, um, the settlements in the Caribbean, some of them were in the Muslims, uh, the first chance continental crossings, right? Um, and about 20% 20 of the 20% 20, uh, 20 of the slaves that were brought from Africa were Muslims. There's some estimates about that. Um, so really a lot of the African Americans who came, you know, were forced to, you know, in, into slavery, uh, they were Muslims. And uh, because, you know, Af you know, Islam has spread quite a bit in, in, in Africa. Uh, also in the 1800s, 1880, the first Muslim, you know, uh, Syrians, you know, we have you know records of that one. Back in 1934, in the Midwest, uh, there is a in Cedar Rapid, Iowa. They call that the Mother Mosque, where um, um, you know it, it was, you know, the first mosque that we, 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 you know, we can document that it was, you know, built. Um, so the, you know, that, you know, it's, 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 we have like a, a you know a long history in the United States, though the numbers are continues to be small. Uh, also, Muslims, you know, have had a good relationship with the United States. Uh, here's an example of a letter in by uh, you know George Washington to the King of Morocco, right? He's you know in in Africa, uh, and that is for an appreciation of the treaty uh, of peace and friendship that they signed in, in 1787. Some people consider actually Morocco. Uh, technically, <laughs> to be the first uh, country that you know acknowledged the independent the independence of the United States because it allowed <clears throat> the United States ships with the United States flags you know to park or, or to go into the ports of, of, of Morocco. Uh, in this picture, you see, or in this slide, you see that uh, you know a couple of the slaves, or famous stories of those two, you know, two slaves who were brought into the United States, and they were Muslims. Ayub Suleiman Diallo, right? He was the son of a an imam, an imam is a, like a Muslim leader or a preacher, right, or a pastor. Uh, he was forced into slavery and brought him here. And the second one on the right is Abdul Rahman, <laughs> Abdul Rahman Ibrahim, and he was a Muslim prince. He was the son of, a, you know, a, you know, a, 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 like a, a king over there, and he was forced into slavery in the United States. And also the records uh, from the American Revolutionary War indicates that some Muslims actually fought on the American side, like for example, Yusuf bin Ali and Pumpet Muhammad. In, in recent history here, probably, I don't know if you can recognize some of those people, but um, on the top left, uh, two pictures of S Sister Ibtihaj Muhammad. She, uh, and uh, on the top right, Sister uh, De uh, Delila Muhammad, uh, they both competed in the Rio uh, 2016 for the USA team, and they both won some gold and silver, I think. Uh, uh, Sister Ibtihaj uh, brought in the silver medal and Sister Muhammad brought in the gold medal. And she, I think she was the first woman who won the 400 uh, yard uh, in the United States, you know, ever in the United States <laughs> in, in, in the Olympics. So really cool. Uh, also Dr. Oz, Muhammad Ali and rapper Ice Cube. So, you know, Muslims are all over in the United States. And this is just a sample of pictures that, you know, really famous people that you probably are aware of, uh, but you do not know maybe they were Muslims in the past. The last thing I want to mention to you about is the Muslim challenges in the in the United States nowadays. You know, after the terror attack of 9/11, the generalization of terrorism, you know, or the you know that people have uh, uh, on Muslims, you know, really one of the biggest challenges for Muslims. Uh, people accuse, you know, you know, have have you know have almost have all Muslims guilty by association just you know because of the terrorists were of uh, you know an Islamic faith, as if the only terrorists are always Muslims, you know. Uh, which is not true, right? You know, we've seen terrorism come from all different faiths, uh, but you know, now you know the, the media and the social norms are casting a lot of uh, bad, you know, images on the Muslims because of that. We have seen attacks on Islamic centers, um, even in Austin, our North Austin Muslim Community Center has been vandalized. Islamic Center of Flugerville has been vandalized. Uh, because of just ignorance among the people where they associate everything, you know, uh, they brush everybody with the same big brush. Uh, they also have seen attacks on Muslim women who wear the hijab or the headscarf. Um, we've seen also systematic profiling of individuals, and that's really the most scaring, scary part when this becomes a an institutionalized thing. Um, 
And there's a lot of misunderstanding and uh, misconceptions about Islam. I think this is really the, the, the majority of the challenges uh, you know, that we face in the United States. But since as we are members of the United States, as members, as you know, citizens of the United States, our families still go through the same, every other family, our teens are, are, are challenged, our youth are challenged, our, you know, uh, our, you know, you know, the whole family is, is challenged, but I think that's just like everybody else. But those specific things about the Muslims in, in the United States. I want to show you one last picture here, uh, and I want you to see how much wrong in this picture. So, you know, if you, if you can count the errors in this picture, right? Um, and and this, is, this is where I talk about the challenges uh, that we face. So, if you look, for example, at the sign here, right, on the on, on the left side. Um, you know, we don't worship Muhammad, <laughs> uh, and, and you could see the you could see the, you know the misunderstanding and the misconception about the Prophet peace be upon him. Right? Not only that, Muhammad is we know that Muhammad is dead. We believe Muhammad is just a human being. He's just a prophet. We don't worship him. We worship the, the God, the the everlasting. Uh, the second sign on the right, for example, it says no Sharia in the United States. Sharia is the is the code of conduct for Muslims. Actually, what forces me as a Muslim to abide by the United States constitutions is the Sharia, because the Sharia tells me to fulfill my promises. You know, when I came to the United States, I initially, when I accepted my visa, I had to sign, you know, on that visa applications that I will fulfill my, uh, you know, you know, obey the laws of the land. And it is Islam that requires me to fulfill that covenant. Right, it, it, that signature has value to it, right? Or when I take the oath, when I you know, when you become a citizen, Islam forces you, right, to fulfill your covenant, and that's one of the uh, one of the clear verses in the Quran. Yeah, amanu awfu bil -uqud. Oh, you who believe, fulfill your covenants. So, as I said, Sharia is 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 the is the the code of of lifestyle for our Muslims, and that's what they, you you know, people misunderstand. They think Sharia is just the penal system that's just gonna punish people and so on. I just really they really don't understand. What, what, what Sharia is, 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 is all about. And that's number one. Number two, as I said, we are 1% of the population, <laughs> right? 1% of the population. Do you think that uh, this number of people is gonna be able to change the United States constitutions, assumingly, right? Like the second sign here at the bottom says 100% constitution and 0% Sharia. It's just really that misconception and what people have been fed uh, all, all, all along. So I hope this is, you know, a little bit enlightening to you. I hope this was helpful to you about understanding some of the uh, things about Islam. Please join in singing today's hymn, Our Faith is But a Single Gem. Our faith is but a single gem Upon a rosary of beads The thread of truth which runs through them Supports our varied human needs Confusion, wisdom, Christian care A Buddhist way of self Extinguishing this chalice signifies the end to our service, but it does not mean an end to our commitment to justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Salam, shalom, peace. All right, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the five pillars of Islam. Now, um, as a you know, when when a house has pillars and we say there's a foundation for a house, of course that does not make the entire house. But it's but these are the most important uh, set of rituals that we as Muslims uh, you know follow. But there's a lot of other things to, to you know to build that house and to make it a livable house. Um, but those are the, the most critical things in Islam. Uh, 
The first one is what we call the shahada or the testimony. Now, uh, you know, as I told you earlier, that uh, the most important thing in Islam is the concept of the oneness of God. And sure enough, the testimony here is also the first pillar, which is for a person to testify out of their own, you know, trust and love in, in God, that there is no one worthy of worship, no God, no deity, worthy of worship except Allah, except one God. And uh, second, and Muhammad is his messenger. And this is really a two-part type of testimony. One to testify that God exists, testify that God is one, right? And then the second thing is to testify that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God, which means that we will follow the teaching of, of, of God. We will follow... Uh, the, the, we will follow the divine based on the teachings of Muhammad, who is a messenger of God. The second pillar of Islam is what we call the prayers, right? And these are ritualistic prayers, meaning they require us to do them at specific times. It's required for us to do them in a specific way and specific manner. There are other forms of prayers, of course, what we call supplication, that you could do them at any time you want. And you could just ask God for anything that you want. Those also are prayers. But here, what we're referring to is the actual, you know, um, ritual of prayers. And as Muslims, we pray five times a day. The third pillar of Islam is giving a zakah, which is, or giving charity. Now, charity um, is, um, there are specific rules and regulations on charity, but in general, it is based on annual savings, right? Not annual income, unlike your taxes, <laughs> that comes on your annual income, it's annual savings. So if a person earned a million dollar, and use that million dollar, you know, um, then there is no zakah requirements on him. But if this person saved half a million dollar or saved the entire million dollar, and that million dollar stayed with them, and they have not used it for an entire lunar calendar year, which is similar, almost close as a normal calendar, right? Then the person is required to pay about two and a half percent on that savings. And they give, and we have, you know, well-defined six exits of the charity, you know, for the poor, the needy, the one in debt, and so on. The fourth pillar of Islam is the uh, Siyam Ramadan. Right now, we are actually in the month of Ramadan. Today is the 21st night of, of the month of Ramadan. And Ramadan is the ninth month in the lunar calendar, in the Muslim lunar calendar. And... Um, you know, we believe that, you know, the Quran tells us that the month of Ramadan is special because the Holy Quran was revealed in the month of Ramadan. That's why the month of Ramadan is so, is, is so special. And the Muslims conduct during the day fasting and during the night they do optional and additional prayers, you know, to God the Almighty. Now, the fasting of the Muslims starts from dark souls a lot. And, you know, growing up as a child, you know, practicing the fasting, you know, of course, it only, you know, it's only required when the age, when the person gets the age of puberty. But even the little children, sometimes they practice fasting. And throughout the years, they build this concept of, of self-control. Uh, the fifth the fifth pillar of Islam is performing Hajj, or what we call the pilgrimage to the city of Mecca. Now, the... This is only for the people who can afford it and take the word afford it and expand it as much as you can, because really, you, you, you know, a person must be able to afford it financially. The, 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 the path has to be safe, right? The travel has to be safe and so on. So if you can, if any of these things are not available, a person cannot afford it financially, you know, that it's, it's a dangerous trip or something like that, then it's no longer an oblig obligation. All right. So, and the last couple of pictures I want to show you is, Actually, Mecca here is the the Kaaba, which is the this is really just a mosque, and you know, uh, you know, for, for prayers, and all those people surround it. Now, if you look at this picture and the next one, and you can see, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how people are making circles around the Kaaba, and that's how we pray, right? So we pray around the Kaaba, and the circles, as you expand from the Kaaba, continues to go bigger and bigger and bigger. So when we Muslims pray all over the world, right, we face Mecca all the time which means we are literally virtually standing in one of those bigger circles. So if a person lives in the far east, right, they would be facing west. And if somebody living in the west, they would be facing east, right? And read is all about no matter where the person goes across the whole world, north, south, east, west, right? They're always turning towards the center of monetism. And they are part of this bigger circle around this Kaaba, wherever they are. So it's really a, a, a beautiful uh, spiritual things for, for the Muslims. I don't want to spend too much time describing being the five pillars of Islam, but I just wanted to give it to you, you know, give you a quick understanding of those. And thank you so much.